On a quiet afternoon in downtown Miami this week, both Kartik and I had the chance to sit down for an interview with one of the greatest soccer commentators in this game. To me, John Champion has become the voice of soccer. He's a man with a long, distinguished career in the game who has traveled the world to bring matches to us. In his role for ESPN as one of their lead announcers for the International Champions Cup, we had a chance to discuss a wide range of topics with him, such as how the role of a football commentator has changed over time, how he manages his time when he sometimes calls as many as five games in a week, in addition to his honest observations about his time in Russia calling the World Cup on ITV. The scene for this interview was outside overlooking Key Biscayne in downtown Miami. You'll hear the natural sounds of wind and police sirens in the background, but stick through it, and I hope you'll agree that this is a pleasure to listen to the dulcet tones of John Champion, not calling a game, but being interviewed about the beautiful game. First question I have is, is how much has the role of a football commentator changed since the, the time you first, uh, first called a, a game for the BBC, which was, I think, 1989, if I remember correctly? Uh, yes, I mean, I go back to 1984, really, was when I first started in, in local broadcasting when I was still a, still a teenager. Um, in terms of national broadcasting, yes, you're, you're right, sort of 1988, 1989 was the, the first time. How has it changed? That's a, it's an interesting question and, and one that I probably need more time to reflect on, really, to answer fully. Um, I think the role of the commentator is more or less as, as it's ever been. I mean, I think you have to make a distinction between radio and television. Radio, you are people's eyes, and therefore you have to describe everything. Television, you're just there to augment the picture that's already provided. So really the job is entirely different, and it's more about economy of language and trying to find the right words than radio, which is, yes, you need to find the right words, evidently, but you can be fairly loquacious, which is not something that should really be available to you on, on, on TV. Uh, I'm always mystified by people that, that say that uh, they listen to a broadcast on television and, and it's a radio commentary that's being applied to the TV pictures, and they find that very satisfying, because I'm thinking, well, surely they must be talking too much for TV tastes if it's a radio broadcast. So I, I'm very much from a, a school of, of less is more, yeah. Um, and, and that was something that was inculcated in, into me, really, by those people at the BBC, people like Barry Davis, uh, John Motson, 30-odd years ago. In terms of your question specifically, though, how has the role changed? I don't think it has. Mm -hmm. I think maybe how we're perceived has changed in certain respects, but in terms of what our job is, what we're meant to do, how we should do it, I don't, I don't see a, a massive change. What, what about the position of, kind of a commentator maybe being now on television a little bit more on, on camera? Yes, there is that. There is that. Um, that. That seems to be ever more popular, although I think more here than in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I spend the majority of my time standing in front of a, a camera when I'm on American television rather than British or European outlets. Yes, we do a little bit of that on the Premier League World Feed because international broadcasters seem to like that sort of thing, to be able to put a face to the voice that's subsequently going to call the game. And I can, I can see why. And that was never really part of the remit three decades ago. It's, it's crept in really in the last 10 years, I'd say. Now from 84 to 89, kind mm. of starting as your role in radio as well as television, could you ever in your wildest dreams imagine how big the English club football would become around the world as it is? Today. No, because I mean that was the pre pre nineteen ninety, and and I usually trace back to the World Cup of nineteen ninety, Gaza's tears, the advent thereafter of satellite television in the UK, uh, which made it suddenly a sexier product, the creation of the Premier League brand. Um, that that really was the watershed moment. So I worked for six years prior to that, and I was covering the old first division, the old football league. Uh, which were the same big clubs, but it wasn't jazzed up in the same way. We were going through the horrors of, of Hillsborough and Heysel. Um, we were in the grip of a dreadful hooliganism problem, which hadn't really been dealt with. So football was not a popular activity to attach oneself to. If you were a neutral, uh, wanting a sport or an entertainment to, to grab you, uh, and, and to say, look, come and support me, be part of this. Football was not that thing mm -hmm. at that stage because uh, parents would, would be reticent about allowing their children to go to 
football, the TV coverage had become rather staid. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no real competition for the rights. It was just on the BBC and just on ITV, which was great insofar as it reached big audiences, but there was comparatively little live football. So it was a different world back then. And then the World Cup came along, England got to the semi-final, Gascoigne became a, a national, fairly iconic figure. There were the tears, there were the likes of Lineker alongside him, there were moments involving Chris Waddle and Terry Butcher, and suddenly there was an affinity between the public and the team. Off the back of that, this huge TV deal was done in 1992 to create Sky Television and to create the Premier League, and since then it, it's been so markedly different that I could never really have plotted this trajectory that we're now on. Has that money filtered down at all to commentators? Ha <laughs> good question. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't realised you were a comedian as well, Chris. Um, no. <laughs> no, it hasn't really. And in fact, there are many more of us doing the job now. So, so probably it's not comparatively quite as lucrative as it, as it was three or four decades ago. Um, because there are more outlets. So there isn't that... Um, there isn't that scarcity value to football right. on television that there was before. So if you were John Motson and you were calling the FA Cup final for the BBC, which was one of perhaps two or three live games on British television that year, you could virtually name your own price, I imagine. That's certainly not the case now. So from, from 84 to 89, kind of your early years, Yes. did you ever run, run into any harrowing experiences with hooliganism, whether it was at railway stations or in grounds as a commentator? Uh, going to grounds, I mean, the police got to the stage where they were able to just about control things within stadiums but the problem just moved outside I mean I, I remember being at Luton when there was a horrible riot against Millwall uh, and that that was pretty awful to be in the midst of uh, but after a while you got to the stage where you sort of knew where to go to avoid the worst of the trouble and you would delay your exit from a ground at the end for maybe half an hour 45 minutes if you're in London so you wouldn't be hitting the tube station at the same time as some of the rowdier elements of the supporters and you adjusted your approach to things uh, accordingly I, I don't think I didn't live through the very worst I mean the, the 70s I think were the, the the real bad days the real dark days and supporters of clubs like Leeds and Millwall and Birmingham had a very bad name at that time as well and there were some some horrible incidents I was fortunate to uh, uh, avoid the the majority of those and during the course of a season you're, you're probably I'm sure on a very friendly basis with co-commentators co uh, up and down the country but what about the commentators do you get a chance to fraternize or kind of hang out with the Martin Tyler's or Peter Drury's the well uh, yes from time to time if we're in the same place mm -hmm. um, We'll all, uh, I mean, people like uh, Martin and Peter and myself and Clive Tildesley, um, Rob Hawthorne from Sky, we'll, we'll exchange notes on pronunciations and things like that, particularly in the early weeks of a season if we're dealing with new players or new managers. Um, so, yes, we, we talk in, in those terms. And if I'm, if I'm at a game for the Premier League world feed that Martin Tyler is commentating on for Sky Television, then, yes, we'll sit and have a cup of tea and have a 20-minute conversation beforehand so we do see a reasonable amount of each other but uh, clearly we see more of the co-commentators than our fellow commentators sure. now this uh, this past winter in britain there's pretty heavy snow yes and we saw pictures on, on twitter which was pretty exciting of, of the snow kind of are you trying to get to one, one, one particular one particular ground yes a any changes there any any uh, any uh, changes i mean the british weather so uh Anyway, well, it's, uh, just, it's usually so boring, but it's, been, it's actually been quite interesting the last year because when I came away, I'd been in Russia for six weeks, so I'd missed most of it, but I got home and my wife said, look at the garden. And I looked at where the garden used to be and it was just an arid, almost Arizona-like desert had been created because <laughs> they'd gone seven weeks without rain and the temperature on the day I came out here last week was 36 degrees, so very un-British. And that was preceded by this extraordinary winter in our terms. I mean, it would be nothing to people that live in Connecticut and various other places around the US. Yeah. But um, I got snowed in. I live in a very rural area called the Cotswolds and we live uh, at a, a reasonable elevation. Um, so, uh, and, and I'm in a very small village with tiny country roads, so I got snowed in four times last winter and on one of those occasions in particular I had to go to Liverpool and usually I reckon as long as I can get out of my village and get onto a main road which has had the snow plows down it, I've got half a chance, but I had to be towed out of my village by a friend who's a farmer with a tractor about three miles to get to a road that was passable. I have a four by four because right. of where I live, yeah. but I needed that tow for three miles even to be able to, to get going. Right. So we had some fairly interesting experiences last winter. Last question from B before I hand mm. it over to Kartik is, forgive me, I, I actually don't remember, but ha have you had experience with uh, doing commentaries for video games? Or yeah, I did um, pro evolution soccer for eight years. 
Okay. So, and I, I also did a series called International Superstar Soccer. Okay. Prior to that, for the same publisher, the Japanese company Konami. So, yeah, I did that um, with Mark Lawrenson for a while, and then latterly with with Jim Beglin. Okay. Uh, and I signed up thinking I'd do three or four years of it, and ended up doing eight. So, <laughs> I was uh, I was quite happy with that. How how was that experience? I mean, actually recording it pretty pretty brutal. Uh, yes. 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 You you probably found the right word. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'd love to be able to sit here and say it was a fantastic creative process and one of the most uh, invigorating things I've ever done uh, and, and you, know, you get nicely paid for doing it and the product at the end is great to be part of but in terms of a creative process it isn't really because you walk in to the studio usually in the Soho area of London where most of the recording studios are on day one of year one and you basically can't see over the desk in front of you because there is this stack of paper maybe a foot high most of it uh, script written by people who don't really understand too much about football uh, who speak Japanese as their first language rather than English and you know you've got to wade through this vast tranche of script and try and make sense of it so that's a fairly dispiriting moment mm. clearly as you do year on year they have more of an archive and a library right. that you don't need to repeat so you're just really augmenting what they've already got and that becomes an easier process and in fairness to those that make that game pro evolution, pro, pro evolution soccer the, the process now is a lot easier and slicker than it was when I started doing it okay. and I think it probably is probably now a, a rather more rewarding process sure. but the strange thing is that lots of people know you only through your video game yeah. Yeah. so I've traveled the world I remember during the um, 2010 World Cup arriving at a hotel in Cape Town at four o'clock in the morning absolutely knackered Excuse the, the word. Having travelled from the other end on a, a private plane, the other end of South Africa, doing a game, ready to do another game in Cape Town. All I wanted was my bed. And we arrived at reception in this quite nice hotel lobby. And this gentleman, a broad beaming smile, far more awake than I was, said, Ah, oh, Mr. Champion, we've been waiting for you. I said, We? Suddenly, from these other doors, <laughs> two or three of his friends appeared, all with great big cardboard boxes. And I said, well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, uh, what are you expecting from me? And they said, oh, we're, we're all huge fans of Pro Evolution Soccer. I hope you don't mind. But we think if you would deign to sign these games that we bought, we might be able to you know, do quite well on eBay or, right. or whatever. And each of them had bought about 50 <laughs> games. So I had 200 copies of Pro Evolution Soccer to sign at 4 a.m. in the morning before I was allowed to go to my room and go to bed. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, it, it's amazing in the United States how many people know you from um, your work on PES. Have you found that when you've uh, traveled around the U.S.? I have, and, and I'm aware through talking to Martin Tyler and, and John Motson as well, that when they have done FIFA, um, they're known by huge numbers of people only for doing FIFA, not for the fact that they've been wonderful match commentators <laughs> on live television for the last 40 years. So it, it's strange. It does make you stop and think about how people actually get to know who you are and what you do, um, because I would never, if I'm writing down my CV, being the voice of Pro Evolution Soccer for eight years would not be in the top five or ten items, because I'm just conditioned to think of myself as a first radio and then TV football commentator, not, the, the, the video game thing is a nice sideline, it's an adjunct, it's not the main business. Right? Uh, you just finished the World Cup in Russia, mm. commentating for ITV, you mentioned 1990 earlier. Yes. Chris, and, and Gaza's tears and Turin and all of that. Does 2018 have the potential to have the same kind of stimulus with the British public that 1990 did? Well, I don't think I don't think that same stimulus is needed because football is so much more popular than it was 28 years ago in the United Kingdom. Um, but there has certainly been a re reconnection between the England support and the national team, which has been fractured in in recent years. Uh, but I, I must say, I approached Russia with a bit of trepidation. Uh, just because we'd all been fed these stories of what it was likely to be like, how difficult it was going to be to travel around, how we'd got to be very careful with our laptops, um, cyber security, uh, our own personal security. We were given security guards as well. I must say I had a ball. Um, and, and it will go down as one of my favourite World Cups. Having said all that, I accept that we were presented with a facade of what Vladimir Putin wanted the world to perceive Russia to be. And the lengths that they had gone to were clearly fairly extraordinary. I mean, all the stray dogs that are always such a feature of the streets of Moscow, and I've been for previous European games, have been shipped out. All the homeless people have been shipped out. Everything had been painted. I have always approached with trepidation the idea of flying on Aeroflot 
in fact they've become a, a joke to many people well let me tell you they have a fleet of planes that is entirely brand new and I've never known an airline run so closely to time over a sustained period and we had great apart from their in-flight sandwiches we had great experiences with Aeroflot so everything possible had been done to present this facade to the world that Russia is a wonderful place and of course in many senses it is and Ali McCoyst who was co-commentating with me uh, greatly enjoyed the historical perspective and we visited some some jaw-dropping places Kazan which I'd never been to before with its its Kremlin its government building which is 300 years old and much of it is made of gold it, it's just an astonishing sight and there were a good number of those are around the country to enjoy uh, and the people also had embraced it but there was a, a major delineation between those under the age of say 35 who hadn't lived through the Soviet era so if you went to try and talk to them and smile broadly at them they'd want to engage with you they'd try and speak English with you and they'd be pleased to see you anyone that had been through the Soviet era um, you try and smile at them and you get a, a face of stone back they didn't want any part of you or why you were there and they were slightly uneasy in your presence so that still remains but the whole thing was just a fascination of contrast for a month and it's, a, it's an experience of genuinely treasure when you call EFL matches often you mm. are a sole commentator yes uh, walk us through how that's different being the one and only commentator eyes and ears for the world as opposed to when you're working with the commentator Okay. Um, I mean, not only are you a sole commentator, but you are also doing those almost exclusively off monitor. So you sit in a broom cupboard at a little production house in West London in an area called Shepherd's Bush, and it's it's quite a lonely experience, really. And it doesn't have any of the rigmarole and the uh, production backup that the live coverage of the Premier League has, where you're always on site at the stadium, where you have lots of producers in your ears, uh, and you're aware that there is a big global audience. I mean, the Football League is a very fine product but for most international TV companies it is a niche product here it's on ESPN plus and it's an important part of their drive to try and establish themselves in the streaming world um, but I remember looking at, at some of the information that you would publish on World Soccer talk about the old viewing figures when it was on being sports and I'd have a look and I would think well that game that I did last week between Aston Villa and Birmingham second city derby that must have got a good audience 7,000 people in a country of 300 million so you're under no illusion, this, this isn't something that's being consumed in the same way as the Premier League product that you're going to do on the Saturday and the Sunday of that weekend. But it's really fun. the games are often very good. It's a real marathon with a 46-game league season. But it is a belt and braces operation rather than the more luxurious surroundings of covering a Premier League game. Last question for me. Last question for me, John. Uh, Let's say you have a week where you're working a championship game on Friday off a monitor in Shepherd's Bush, Saturday Premier League, Sunday Premier League, Tuesday International here in the States uh, for ESPN. Walk us yes. through that week for John Champion. Um, it's quite busy. Because <laughs> it may well have come off the back of a week. I mean, you, you started on the Friday there with Football League, Premier League Saturday, Sunday, then maybe International in the US on Tuesday. It may well have been the Tuesday, Wednesday. I've been doing Champions yeah. League somewhere. Right. Thursday, Europa League. In so uh, it, it can get pretty frenetic. So my week would be um, traveling and preparing. So if I've been away in Europe, I'd be using the flying time to, to, to do a lot of the prep on the, on the planes. I'd have downloaded uh, videos of matches of the teams I'm about to do onto my laptop so I can watch those while I'm traveling as well. And then really it's just the long hours of preparation. And you, I don't like to say it, but you do have to prioritize. So if you're doing a football league game off monitor on your own for a comparatively small audience you you don't skimp on the preparation but you don't perhaps go into the same detail and depth that you would with the two Premier League games and then the game that you're going to call in the US on the on the Tuesday so you do have to be pragmatic about it ideally you'd want to give the same amount of preparation to every game you just can't do it I did uh, 171 games last season you can't sustain the prep over that number of matches and in many cases you've done those championship teams before also yes like it helps right. so the, the most difficult month of the season is the first month where everything's unfamiliar what about, what about international champions cups so, yeah. again the city that has this huge squad of youth players yes many of them were probably not as aware of as, as youth players True. how much more research would go into an icc match a lot i mean i've spent the entire morning uh, researching the youngsters of manchester united because i've got them against real madrid here in Miami tomorrow in the International Champions Cup so that takes a lot of time. I've also downloaded the videos of the previous matches mostly they've come on a substitute but at least I'll be able to get 10 minutes of how they look, how they play, 
where they play, you know, their running style, identifying features. So that that's an important currency, really. So, so when it, when are you uh, looking for boot colours? So if you, from the, the gantry, the commentators' booth, mm. looking in terms of. Uh, I'm looking at footwear, I'm looking at hairstyles, I'm looking at running styles, I'm looking at short sleeves or long sleeves. But with the, with the boots, would they, would they change match to match or they can they, usually... Yeah, they, so, they can. They can change match to match. So I find boots are a very unreliable guide okay. to trying to identify a player from 150 yards away. Right. I need to find other distinguishing features. Right. Okay. Last question for me is, mm. is when we spoke a year ago, you talked about... Uh, when you were in school and getting ready to leave school, you were thinking about saving your money to travel. Yes. Uh, and then, then you got sucked into kind of the, uh, the world of, of uh, radio commentary on weekends and going to the university yes. in order to get to get uh, a job with the BBC. Yeah. From the travel perspective, have you had a chance to uh, travel the world uh, either with football or without football? And, and, and is, is travel still a burning passion of yours? Oh, it is. I love the travel. Um, and, uh, you know, happily on this occasion, once I've done this game, in Miami the schedule eases off a little and I've got another eight days with just two games to do so my wife's coming over to spend a, a week she flies into Boston on Wednesday which will be great we've also taken the opportunity when I've been working for ESPN in the US over the last few summers to bring the family over we've got four kids so it's been great for them to travel around allied to to my work but beyond that yes I mean I've been I've been lucky enough to travel to large areas of the world at someone else's expense which is wonderful and maybe when I retire I'll go and fill in the gaps I mean I've never been to India for example I had an offer to go and do the Indian Premier League but it, it clashes with the EPL so it just it wasn't a go but it would be lovely to, to go one day and go and watch some cricket in India I'd love to oh, do yeah. that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, would, I would dearly like to go back to Australia where I've spent some time in the past and New Zealand as well I've, I've not been for a number of years so uh, there are lots of things sure. uh, and it's strange I grew up as a child I didn't go on a, an aeroplane until I was 22 because my, my parents, they didn't have a whole lot of money, and so all our holidays were always domestic in the UK. The only time I'd been abroad was on a, a school trip to Switzerland when I was 14. So I started late, but I've spent most of the last 30 years trying to catch up on what I missed, I think. I, I just remember one, one more question. Mm. Social media, Twitter especially, you're, you're pretty active on Twitter. What's it been like uh, uh, just communicating with, with fans and supporters from around the world through Twitter? Uh, you mean whether it's answering questions or, or just, yeah. just having conversations? It's good. Um, I mean, I was uh, I was very sceptical about social media for a long time, and I was a very late convert, really only about 18 months ago. And it was partly pressure from broadcasting organisations that I work for, because they do like their broadcasters to be on social media. So I did it slightly reluctantly, um, and fearing that I was going to get hammered all the time, because I, I understand that the... There is a lot of negativity on there. And, and I have to say, I haven't really had any bad experiences. Um, I, I purposely don't go out there looking for trouble on social media. And I just use it as a tool, really, to put out there what I'm doing and the occasional opinion on something I've seen or experienced. So that's quite nice. And I do enjoy the interaction. And doing the, the Premier League World feed, you do find yourself in touch with supporters from right around the world. And it gives you an idea of the scale of the... Uh, the product and the profile that the EPL now enjoys around the world yeah. in that you are in, indulging or in, invited to indulge in conversations with people from right around the globe, some of whom have very different opinions to yours, but it's right. it's fascinating to hear them nonetheless. Yeah, yeah I, I enjoy it because it adds a human touch to the, the commentators. Oftentimes we, we hear your voice sometimes more than our, our partners or our wives or children sometimes if it's a busy week or something like that. But. Uh, but yeah, no, no, I think it's a great way to connect. I think it also, it also allows you to gauge. I mean, during the last World Cup, where doing World Cups of British television can be a fairly intense experience. And in the days when there were only newspapers, you knew when you signed up that you were, you were basically signing up, yes, to cover one of the world's great sporting events, but also to be severely criticised for four weeks in print. Right. But now with social media, I mean, yes, people will have a go at you and they have every right to, and that's fine. But at the same time, if you are striking a chord, uh, and, and the perception was that, that with Ali McCoist we sort of we found a good way of working at the World Cup for ITV this summer then suddenly you get an idea that actually you are hitting the mark mm -hmm. so yeah. yes if you haven't got something quite right you know about it but equally if if you have touched a chord you probably find that that's also reflected and that's that's quite nice and reassuring I think yeah we, we've we've actually heard some good things about Ali McCoist do you know if there's any chance that uh, he might be coming on to airwaves uh 
the rest of the season or what, for other seasons? I don't know, but someone from the Premier League rang me and said, what's his telephone number? So maybe oh, there's okay. a chance that he'll be doing, doing something. I don't know, that might have been yeah. something completely yeah, yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was part of the ESPN team for the World Cup in 2010, yes. okay. I yes. believe. But I, I think that the view <laughs> on that occasion, maybe unfairly, I, I don't know, it's not really for me to say, was that his Scottish accent yeah. was difficult <laughs> to interpret. Um, and they were absolutely right. His Scottish accent is difficult to interpret. Right. But you don't meet too many ex-footballers with the degree of charm and charisma that McCoyst has. He, he seems to be beloved by everyone. So it'd be lovely to think that there was a, an opening whereby his voice might be heard slightly more in the US in future. Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, talking to us on Little Soccer Talk, and uh, best of luck this season. Well, you have a great season too. I enjoy following everything you do on the site. So, um, yeah, best of luck. Great. Thank you. Thanks.